for Pastor Deepika. And God, I thank you uh, for uh, just connecting us over together in this call in spite of a late start, Jesus. Lord, I pray that you will speak to us today. You will reveal yourself to us today, God, and we will uh, understand more and more about you. We will get to know more about you, Jesus. And God, let our spiritual eyes and ears be open as you teach us the truths in the Bible, God. Help us to be fully convinced and to grow into more like you, Jesus. I give you all the glory and honor. And God, I pray for good Wi-Fi connection throughout the session. Let everything that we do and talk be done for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Yes, let's hope that there are no issues with the internet as I'm having to do this session from home. Uh, so yeah, let's just you know pray that everything goes smoothly and well. All right. So today we are starting off with uh, Colossians. Uh, so um, uh, if you remember when we had covered the very first epistle that we were doing together, Galatians. Uh, at that time, we talked about how um, Paul's first missionary journey was into uh, southeastern Asia Minor. Uh, so when he starts off in his first missionary journey, the Lord guides him to go towards Asia Minor. And then we've also uh, you know, talked about how Asia Minor is basically the Anatolian Peninsula where you have Turkey and all the surrounding regions today. So this is basically Asia Minor. And a lot of Paul's ministry uh, happened over here in this particular region. So um, two very important provinces in this um, Asia Minor. Uh, one is the Galatian province, and the other is the Phrygian province. That would be PHRY. G I A N. Uh, so the you know the people of Phrygia. So um, the Galatian province and the Phrygian province were basically next to each other. So on his first missionary journey, uh, Paul uh, plants a church in Galatia, uh, but at that time he is not led by the Lord to go into the Phrygian province. Uh, so it's only later on uh, when. Um, after the Ephesian church has been planted and and you know Paul starts doing his ministry work over there um, and uh, there are a lot of people getting um, um, you know equipped in the Ephesian church to go out and do ministry uh, one of the persons who gets trained under Paul a person named Epaphras he's the one who goes from this um, you know uh, from this um, from if he, from Ephesus, he goes into the Phrygian province. And that is basically when he sets up this church in Colossae. So it was not Paul himself who planted the Colossian church. Uh, it was Epaphras who did it. And moreover, we get to know, you know, in the letter, Paul says, um, uh, you have never seen me, he says. So he never had, in fact, even visited them uh, when um, he writes this letter. So maybe after he wrote the letter, maybe he had an opportunity to visit them at some point of time. We do not know. But um, at the time of the writing of this letter, he had not even met them. Uh, you know, but they had high regard for him. And uh, they, uh, you know, they would have respected this letter which he has sent them. So uh, that's a little bit of the background. Uh, regarding this letter to the Colossians. He's writing to an audience with whom he has never personally met. It is basically Epaphras who has done the ministry in that particular place. So um, uh, what about the people of this, uh, you know, uh, of this city? Uh, you had uh, Phrygians, of course, because this is the, you know, the, the Phrygian province. Uh, you also have a lot of Greeks who have settled in this uh, city. And you also have a large number of Jews who have, um, you know, who are living over here in this uh, Phrygian province of Asia Minor. How did the Jewish uh, population end up over here? Uh, that's because of a Greek king uh, in, um, in, you know, in, in BC era, uh, before Christ was even born, uh, there was this Greek king named Antiochus the Great. 
uh, he takes a lot of the Jewish people from their homeland and he puts them in uh, Asia Minor. Uh, so these people, uh, you know, got settled over there, uh, you know, spent um, many years over there. And so they became known as the Phrygian Jews. So um, when this church was planted by Epaphras over here, uh, you would have obviously had some local Phrygians in the church. There would have also been Greek uh, people coming into the church. And you also had Jewish people becoming part of this um, congregation. Now, actually, there's a uh, mention made of them in Acts chapter 2. Uh, if you remember in Acts chapter 2, that's basically where you have the uh, account of the Pentecostal event. Uh, when the Holy Spirit comes down upon the people uh, who have gathered in prayer in the upper room. So at that time, um, the uh, when, they, when they all begin to speak loudly in tongues, a large crowd, if you remember, is drawn towards that building because they're all wondering from where is the noise coming. And uh, over there, if you look at the um, list of names which are mentioned, uh, you know, of people from which localities have come over there, we see even Phrygia being mentioned. So the uh, Jewish people in Phrygia and the Jewish people who have you know, dis been displaced from their homeland and who are now living in all uh, the other regions, they all come over here at least uh, to, to Jerusalem, at least for the Passover festival, because that's considered uh, the most important festival. Uh, of the Jewish people. So at least for the Passover festival, they all return back to Jerusalem. And uh, uh, so when this event takes place and there's a lot of noise coming from the upper room, uh, a, a large crowd gathers over there to find out what is going on. And among the crowd, you also have Jewish people from this Phrygian province. And uh, so, um, Peter, of course, you know, speaks to them after, uh, I mean, yeah, after they all speak in tongues, uh, Peter comes to the crowd. He says that, you know, we are not drunk. It is just morning. Uh, so it's actually the Holy Spirit who has come down upon us, just as Jesus promised, the Jesus whom you have crucified. He preaches and a large number are saved on that particular day. So there is a likely chance that even some of these Jewish people from the Phrygian region also you know, might have got saved, might have uh, heard what Peter was saying and responded on that day. So they would have taken the gospel back to this um, uh, province of Phrygia. So when Epaphras planted the church at Colosse, there might already have been some believers in that place. Uh, so these um, Jews who have now become believers, also would have been part of the Colossian church. So the Colossian church was basically made up of the local Phrygians. It was made up of Greek settlers who have settled down in Colossae. And also you had this Jewish people who have come to the uh, true faith, who have come to their faith in Jesus Christ. Um, so this is the kind of audience that Paul is writing to. And he basically writes this um, letter during his uh, you know, first arrest during his first imprisonment in Rome. Uh, he, in fact, writes most of his letters at that time, uh, you know, while he's uh, under house arrest in Rome. Uh, so, in fact, there are three letters that he writes together, uh, a letter to the Ephesian people, a letter to the Colossian people, and also a personal letter to Philemon. All of these three letters, he writes them together and he puts them in the hands of um, um, Onesimus and Tychicus. So they are the ones who go and deliver these letters to Ephesus, to Colossae, and also to Philemon. Uh, so, you know, they, these letters were written during his imprisonment. Um, so uh, one thing that yeah, we maybe need to we also mention is that um, Shortly after this letter was written, uh, Colosse experiences a major earthquake. Uh, 
you know, as we all know from last year, um, this Anatolian Peninsula is an area where you constantly have uh, earthquakes happening because you have one of the epicenters, you know, of the earthquakes uh, over there. There's also some kind of an earthquake fracture line which runs through that peninsula. So um, as a result of that, there are generally many earthquakes. So um, uh, the earthquake of 60 AD was so major that they say that it literally flattened out the city of Colosse. So um, the church in that place, the believers of that place would have suffered, you know, when that earthquake took place. Uh, and it says um, generally, you know, historians say that a lot of people relocated to many of the surrounding um, uh, towns and cities until uh, you know Colosse could once again be repaired and rebuilt. So we are not very sure what the poor church went through, you know, after this uh, earthquake experience. Uh, but Paul's letter was written before the earthquake, uh, you know, when this event had not yet taken place. So these are just some of the uh, uh, interesting facts about uh, the Colossian church. Let's get into the uh, letter itself. He is writing, uh, Paul is mainly writing this letter uh, to, to tell the Colossians that Jesus Christ is supreme. These people are uh, kind of wandering away from the true faith into false teachings, especially there's this new teaching which is coming up. Um, it's like the faint beginnings of the Gnostic movement, which would literally take over later on. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, um, by the time John became old, you know, there was a lot of Gnosticism which had set in um, and there were a lot of false teachings going around. Now, when Paul writes this in, uh, before 60 AD, uh, Gnosticism as such has not become established, but the early forms of Gnostic teachings are already going around. You know, this whole idea that you would have uh, spirit beings come to you and give you visions of some mystic knowledge which will make you you know superior to all the other believers um all that kind of you know rubbish that was uh, that john warns about in his epistles and in his gospel so uh, those false teachings have started coming in so paul is writing to say you know don't chase after angels you know to worship them the spirit beings uh, to worship them Jesus is the one who is supreme. He is the one who is your hope. He is the one who is the center of your faith. Uh, so hold on to him. So uh, that is actually the main emphasis of his letter. Uh, so he starts off uh, by uh, you know um, talking about how glad he is for these Colossian believers. He praises certain things about them. And then uh, in the second chapter, he goes on to warn them. Um, you know. Uh, uh, from falling prey to Paul's teachings. All right, so um, we will now look at the first chapter. Uh, we will look at the things about the Colossian believers which pleased Paul, you know, that uh, things that he was glad about. Uh, so if we could have any one person read out for us uh, from Colossians chapter 1, and uh, maybe we can have um, the first eight verses. Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 to 8, please. Yeah, you know, if you could all have your Bibles with you, and, you know, if you could take the effort to unmute and read out. Uh, yeah, Colossians chapter 1. Verses 1 to 8, please. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Jesus Christ and of in Christ Jesus, and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the 
in the word of truth of the truth of the gospel which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you had and knew the grace of God in truth as you also learned from Apiphras our dear fellow servant who is who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf who also declared to you your love in the spirit amen yeah yes thank you so it says here that epaphras has brought them the true message of the gospel okay so he uh, emphasizes that two times in this opening passage epaphras has given them the true message of the gospel and he is glad that they are holding on to it um uh, so in the, you know in the, in the second chapter he warns them about the dangers of going away from this true gospel but right now here he praises them for holding on to this true message of the gospel which has been delivered to them by epaphras and he says uh, there are two things that makes him very very glad he says he whenever he prays for them you know whenever he uh, has his intercessory prayers for this particular church he is so grateful to god uh, for two things he has heard about the faith which they have in Christ Jesus and he has heard about the love that they have for all of God's people so their faith and their love brings him great joy um, uh, and he points out to them that the reason that they have this kind of a very vibrant faith and a very genuine love it is because of the hope which they have the future hope which they are looking forward to so it says in verse 5 colossians 1 verse 5 the faith and love that spring from the hope so this faith and love which they are exercising it is springing up from the hope that they have of what is you know awaiting them in heaven in the future the great reward that is awaiting them and this reward this future hope is um exciting them so much they are so um, you know glad about it that they are willing to make the sacrifices needed to exercise their faith and show their love. It's not easy, you know, to have this kind of commendable faith and this very, uh, uh, what, genuine love. It involves sacrifice. Anything that is truly godly involves sacrifice. The really true things of God never come light. You know, it always involves us having to say no to our own selfish interests, having to say no to the fears and doubts that reign in our hearts and saying, no, I will trust my God. I will obey. I will make the needed sacrifices. I will show love to God's people. Uh, these are all things which involve sacrifice. They do not come easy. Why are these Colossian believers willing to make these sacrifices and exercise this kind of an act? Of faith and active love it's because they are being stirred up by the hope that is there in their hearts so if we see you know in our church today a very um, uh, a very negative complacency where people are not very concerned about others if we see that they are not exercising much faith in the lord and you know um, making their sacrifices uh, of obedience it's because they are not very excited about the things of heaven they're glad that they have a ticket to heaven they are glad that one day you know if when they die that the lord will take them to live with him but there is no real excitement about what is awaiting them they are not even very passionate about the reward which is awaiting them and so that has led to a lot of um, negative complacency which is why today in our churches we don't see the kind of vibrant faith that these early believers exercised we don't see that uh, very generous love which these people lavished on everyone we don't see those things in our current churches simply because we are not very excited about the uh, about what's awaiting us in heaven so you see how it affects um our everyday walk with god um if our eyes are not focused on 
eternity and what is awaiting us over there, we can get very complacent about spiritual things down here. Uh, you know, what are the things that we see uh, believers getting excited about today in our you know current setup? People are very excited about getting uh, high paying jobs. They are very excited about um, you know uh, reaching high up in their careers. Uh, I know going higher up on the career ladder, being able to gain the status you know of uh, being in uh, very high managerial positions where they'll have a lot of people working under them. These are things which excite people a lot. They are very excited about purchasing all the fancy things you know that are now available uh, to us because of technology. They are very excited about owning the you know the expensive gadgets which are you know um, being released. Um, these are things which we see believers being very very excited about. So in the you know in this whole uh, you know chasing of all of these exciting glittering objects down here what is awaiting us in heaven seems to have just paled in comparison people hardly even you know think about uh, the about what is awaiting them in eternity that's just a kind of you know backup secure security plan that is there oh yeah if i die when i die heaven is there but there's no excitement about the things of God. And as a result of that, we do not see the vibrant faith and the genuine love uh, which the Colossians and all the other early uh, believers exercised. So this should be a warning to us. We need to look at this, um, you know, this letter, look at these people and ask ourselves, uh, am I every day actively exercising my faith? you know, in uh, in the way that I am living, in trusting God, in obeying God, in uh, uh, claiming the scriptures, because I really believe in what is, uh, you know, what is available to me in the heavenly realm, the spiritual blessings that are mine, not just the material blessings, but even the spiritual blessings that, I, that can be mine, you know, where God empowers me, he equips me to do his work, uh, where the Lord uses me uh, to reach out to the people and maybe in my office. Uh, so are we excited about these things and vibrantly exercising our faith and also sacrificially showing our love to the people around us? Because it's easy to love some pe people, but it's quite difficult to love some others. Uh, so um, are we doing that? If we are not doing that, then maybe we can ask ourselves, oh, what is the thing that you are passionate about? So if we actually honestly look at ourselves and ask ourselves, what am I really passionate about? What comes to the, uh, you know, uh, what, what is exposed as being our highest priorities? If it is just material things and worldly priorities, uh, then, you know, that will show that, oh, because of this, my faith and my love have been dampened. So, and if that is the case, then, you know, we need to um, take some, uh, corrective measures. Uh, we have not yet come to the Thessalonian letter, you know, which we will be covering uh, after Colossians. But there's something that may uh, a verse from there, which can help us, uh, you know, in in um, in reigniting our passion for God. You know, some something that we are told to do. And actually, this is a verse with reference to the armor of God, which we should be wearing. So, First Thessalonians chapter five. Verse 8, you know, if anyone could read out for us, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8, please. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Yes. So these are the things that we are asked, you know, to put on as believers. Faith and love, the two things that, you know, Paul praised the Colossian believers for. These are people, these Colossian believers were people who had put on the uh, faith and love like a breastplate to guard them, to guard their heart, to guard their lungs, to guard their vital organs. You know, that's basically why the breastplate was worn on the battlefield, so that the arrows will not come and pierce your vital organs 
where your heart is, where your lungs are, the things you know which we depend upon, the organs that we depend upon to breathe, to live. So, um, in the same way, a, a physical soldier would wear the breastplate to protect his vital organs. These Colossian believers um, chose to put on the breastplate of faith and love. It kept them alive spiritually. They uh, because they were exercising and walking in this faith and love on a daily basis, they were alive, spiritually alive, active Christians. Um, uh, you know, they were just reflecting upon um, those two or those letters to the churches, you know, the seven uh, letters to the churches in the book of Revelation yesterday. I was just kind of uh, reflecting upon that. And if you notice, in each of those letters, Jesus generally begins with these words. He says, I know your works. To each church, that, that, that's, those are the opening words that he says. And then he, 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 he gives some details about what he personally thinks about their works. So he says, I know your works. And he goes on to say, uh, you know, gives his opinion about their works. It's the same over here with the Colossian church, where Paul is saying, you know, I have seen your works. Your works are flavored with faith and love. And he, you know, he praises them for that. So we and our church, what does God see? And what does God say about our works? You know, the Lord is watching us on a daily basis. So when he looks at me personally, he says, I know your works. I've been watching you. I know your works. And what does he go on to say about my works? In the same way, what does he go on to say about the works of our particular congregation? Does he see the breastplate of faith and love? You know, uh, that is what we should be wearing so that we can guard our vital organs and, and you know, um, protect ourselves in our spiritual walk. Others will be very, very dead spiritually. So this is, this is something more that, uh, um, you know, Paul says to the Thessalonians in First Thessalonians 5.8. He says you that they must also wear the hope of salvation as a helmet. So you see, the helmet that you're wearing is the hope of salvation, the hope of the reward that is awaiting us, the hope of uh, you know the resurrected body that God is going to give us one day. If it's the hope of the things that um, we will be um, we will be rewarded with on that day, because again, if you look at those uh, seven letters to the Revelation churches, to each of them he says, you know. If you live in the way that I want you to, then you will conquer. That word conquer is used you know, in almost all of the seven letters. He says, if you do this, 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 then you will conquer. And in a couple of the letters, he says, then you will rule with me. So there is a rule, you know, uh, there, is, there is good. So rather than being attracted to the positions of, of, of authority and power and status here on this earth, if we can focus on the positions of authority, power and status, which are awaiting us in the future, in eternity, then maybe we would get our priorities right. So we put on this helmet. What helmet is this? This is the helmet of the hope of salvation, of the hope that is awaiting us in eternity, where there are big things awaiting us. So if we just you know, waste away all our energies on the little uh, accomplishments and the little uh, you know, glittering objects here on this earth, what is going to be left? We'll have no energy left for to prepare ourselves for the bigger, greater rewards that are awaiting us in eternity. So therefore, you know, uh, when Paul is writing to the Thessalonians, he says, put on the hope of, the, uh, of salvation as your helmet. If you're wearing that helmet, you'll always be excited about the things of God. You'll always be eagerly anticipating what is awaiting you in heaven. And then automatically, all your other priorities will fall into place. Um, so uh, we see, uh, you know, something nice being said about this particular aspect in First Peter chapter one, verses six to nine as well. Okay, so we are just using this First Peter two examples from First Peter to to look at one example of faith. And one example of love, and what is the focus of these people? You know, what was what was their eye? What were their eyes set upon? 
So uh, just basically, you know, with that in mind, we are looking at this, uh, at these two first, uh, at these two first Peter passages. Uh, so the first passage that I would like us to, you know, read is First Peter one verses six to nine. Look at the look at the kind of faith that these particular people had, and what was driving their faith. What made them so enthusiastic and made them exercise faith in this manner? So that's basically what we would be, you know, um, looking at. So if someone could read out for us First Peter chapter one verses six to nine, please. First Peter one verses six to nine. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even through refined, even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Amen. Yeah, this passage kind of touched my heart because of the wording that is used over here. It talks about these uh, believers who have gone through a fire. You know, it's not been an easy experience for them. They have suffered grief in all kinds of trials. They've gone through a fiery experience. And even after going through something like that, you know, they have held on to their faith and their faith has been proved as being genuine. Even after going through that fire, they came out with a genuine faith because their faith was not just some lighthearted, you know, wishy-washy kind of faith that just got swept away in, once the flames got hot. These people held on to their faith because their eyes were focused on what it says in um, in the second part of verse seven. You know, they were looking at the praise, glory, and honor which would be which would become theirs once Jesus Christ is revealed. And they are so excited about one day getting to see Him. It says that even though they have never seen Him, you know, they are they believe in Him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. And in that way, because of this kind of attitude that they have, this de eager anticipation that they have for what Christ is going to bring along with him, you know, the, this, uh, this eternal spiritual goodies, you know, these rewards which are going to be theirs, it says, because of that, uh, he says, they are happy, you know, and they are excited about receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So these believers here, are very firmly wearing their helmet of salvation. Their hope, their thoughts, their excitement, it's all focused towards the future, towards what is awaiting them. You know, so maybe you know, those of us uh, in, in this group who are actually uh, you know, ministers, pastors, and we get an opportunity to teach, this is what we should teach you know, to our congregations, get them excited about what is awaiting them in the future so that they will not be so focused on the things of the world. If there's nothing to be excited about in heaven, obviously you're going to be more excited about the things over here. On the other hand, if you can show them what is awaiting them in heaven and get them excited about that, then maybe they will get their priorities right. And then we will have alive churches, you know, filled with believers who are excited about the things of God. And then we will see things happening in our church. Our church will actually move forward, make progress. So these are things that you know we can teach our congregations. So um, we looked at an example of the genuineness of faith, which even though it was tried in fiery trials, it came out fully genuine because these guys were excited about Jesus coming back and the praise and the glory and the honor that would be resulting, you know, once Jesus comes and rewards them. Um, so in First Peter, in this in First Peter chapter one. Um, in, in, in a later verse, in verse 22, this is what you know Peter is saying to the people that he's writing to. He says, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. He says, you know, I, uh, I mean, you guys have been uh, purifying yourself by obeying the truth. 
it's not easy obeying the truth is not easy it's going to involve a lot of sacrifice but these guys have done that they have held on to the truth they know that you know um, obeying the truth is going to involve sacrifice and they have done that they have purified themselves one result of that is that because they have purified themselves through painful sacrificial obedience because they have done that they have a sincere love for each other it's not just this you know superficial love where you say hi and bye to people this is a sincere love where you are willing to forgive where you are willing to go out of your way to help someone where you are willing to actually spend time on your knees interceding in prayer for someone who's going through a time of need these are all is it all um, examples of sincere love which has which have come out of a process of purifying yourself through painful sacrifice sacrifices where you have been willing to do that to obey god and then out of that comes sincere love so you know it's in just one sentence paul compliments these colossians and says my goodness every time i pray for you guys when i'm interceding for you guys i feel so happy when i think about the faith that you have the love that you have you know in just one sentence he just kind of compliments them about it but look at what these colossians would have actually had to do in the background to be able to have this kind of a faith and to have this kind of a love it doesn't come lightly these are things which you need to work on and you will work on them only if you are excited about them about what is awaiting you you know in the future so if our eyes are set on that future reward and what christ is going to give us only then will we live in this kind of a faith and this kind of a love so in this colossian letter again and again he comes back to these three words you will see this happening you know throughout the letter faith hope love so the faith and love is what they are acting out and they are acting out the faith and love because of the hope which they have this theme gets repeated in this letter uh, i think about twice or thrice okay so which is why we kind of um, took time to dwell upon this because this is the foundation uh, on which uh, many other things are going to be you know many other teachings are going to be uh, laid uh, so moving on from there um, we will look at a prayer which paul uh, you know prays over these people uh, yeah we only read up to verse 8 right Uh, so Paul's prayer would be extending all the way up to verse fourteen. We've seen this, you know, in other letters. Paul prays in F in for to the in the letter to the Ephesians. He in fact prays two prayers. Um, and then um, I think it was in the letter to the Philippians that he has one prayer for them. Yeah, which he prays over them. Here again in the Colossian letter, there's a prayer that he prays over these people. If you notice, uh, whenever Paul mentions a prayer in his letter it's obviously something significant he prays things for them which are really important which can make a very big difference in their spiritual life so uh, yeah it's good to look at this prayer that he prays for them uh, so um, in uh, it was basically in verse 3 that he told them you know that i know i i i pray for you and I'm, when i'm praying for you i feel a lot of joy he says and now he's kind of explaining what he is praying for them uh, he um so uh, in verse 6 he this is what he had said he said uh, that uh, the gospel has really the true message of the gospel has really borne fruit in the lives of these colossians he's happy and in verse 6 he goes on to say the same gospel has also you know borne much fruit throughout the world and so because uh the gospel is bearing so much fruit in the lives of these colossian believers he says in verse 9 for this reason since the day we heard about you what's the reason the reason is, the reason is you know there's so much fruit being born in your lives because so much fruit is being born in your lives i we have not stopped praying for you he says in verse 9 and then he begins to uh, you know give the prayer points which he has been praying over them uh so um for that we would actually have to look maybe yeah all the way from verse 9 to verse 14 let's look at the three main prayer points that are touched upon uh in this prayer that paul is praying even as he's writing the letter uh yeah if someone could read out for us colossians chapter 1 verses 9 to 14 please 
For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened in with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Yes. yes. So, 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 oh no, I seem to be having a feedback over here of the audio. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, um, in verse 9, he says, We have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God for three things. The first thing that he is asking the Lord for them is that the Lord would, uh, this is in verse 9, so that the Lord would fill them with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding the Spirit gives, so that they may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work. So basically, Paul is saying, I'm very glad that you, the gospel has borne so much fruit in your lives. And now my continued prayer is this, that you'll continue to bear fruit in every good work, you know, uh, living in a way which pleases God, living in a way that is worthy of the Lord. How will you be able to live in this way, pleasing him, living a, a worthy of him? How? For that, you need to know the, you need to become full of the knowledge of his will. If you don't really know what God's will for you is on a daily basis, you will not live in a way which pleases him. You will not live in a way which is worthy of him. You've got to be very aware of his will for you on a daily basis. I mean, we are all very familiar with the general will of God. We know we should love people. We know we should trust God. We know we should obey him. We know the general will of God. But for me, specifically, what does the Holy Spirit want me to be doing today? I need to be full of the knowledge of this will of God. If I am, then the way I live on a daily basis will be very different. It will be a very active Christian walk where I'm responding to the Holy Spirit on a on a hour by hour basis and he's pleased. He's pleased with what I'm doing hour by hour throughout the day because I'm so full of the awareness of what his will is for me specifically and I'm walking in that. That is walking you know, at a whole new level you know, in, in our Christian walk. So just simply going through the day in a, in a very random way um, may not be as effective. So he's saying, I want you to become even more fruitful in your good works. And that will take place if you are fulfilled with the knowledge of his will. So we'll just dwell a little more upon this you know, when we come back from our break. Uh, so yes, if we can all log back in at 10 o'clock, please. Thank you. <laughs>